Thank you very much. Uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Joan Rose, who is the Homer Nowling Endowed Chair for Water Research. Joan, as you all know, is a former Clark Laureate and a member of the National Academies of Engineering, and she's a world foremost authority in water microbiology. And she will tell us a little bit about uh, the Great Lakes today. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as you know, I'm a Southern California girl. I grew up in Victorville on the high desert, and I was just visiting my mom. And uh, I've been in Michigan now nine years. I couldn't believe it when I was uh, th uh, thinking about that. And um, it's really great to be here and see my colleagues and my friends. And congratulations, Pedro, of, on your award. So we'll be partying later tonight. <laughs> so. Um, the Great Lakes, uh, as you probably know, uh, hold 20% of the freshwater, uh, surface water in, in North America. I mean, they're, they're, they're really a uh, large system. Uh, several years ago, President Obama passed a, a, um, a legislation to put in uh, research dollars about $20 million uh, for looking at restoration of the Great Lakes. And I can tell you this has been going on a long time. And when I first got there, I found out about some of the history, and that's what I want to share with you today about uh, what had happened in the past and what we're doing uh, today to uh, meet uh, restoration of this water body, this great water body. So overview of the problem. So water quality degradation has been a, a problem in the Great Lakes since the settlement. Uh, this is a transboundary water. So uh, the boundary treaty was signed in 1909. And I want to talk, I'm a microbiologist, so I want to talk to you about one of the largest uh, microbiological studies of water quality ever um, undertaken. And as far as I know, this is the largest study ever undertaken in the world. Um, and, you know, the Water Quality Agreement, um, this was a, a treaty uh, in 1909, but the Water Quality Agreement came uh, around the same time as the Clean Water Act, but uh, this is an ongoing concern in terms of uh, uh, the 100 years. So the Boundary Waters Treaty was signed in 1909. It governed navigation, water use, and water quality. Uh, it's evolved, of course, uh, to ecosystem protection, uh, recreation and tourism, that shoreline, of course, water supply. Um, it's got a big focus on monitoring and assessment. And um, it really looks at mechanisms for implementing uh, large-scale uh, restoration. And I'm going to talk about how complicated that is. Now, most of you know that in the microbiology arena, we've been using uh, very similar methods <laughs> for almost 100 years. Um, it's used by local health departments, state, federal government agencies, and academic scientists. Uh, they, it's reliable. There's a lot of data there. Um, and it's focused on fecal contamination, uh, both from animals and humans. The current standards, really, for water quality globally are based on E. coli. Um, if we look at what happens at the tap, at least in the United States, we still are trying to use total coliforms. Um, but E. coli is still the driver in terms of do we think there's a health risk um, at the top? And of course, it's used for ambient water. Now, many of you in this room are, are kind of a, a, a in between. You work in both perhaps the wastewater and the drinking water side or in between there in the reclamation side. And I have to say that I think that uh, we need to speak up more about science and technology on the wastewater side of the equation and not just for reclamation. Um, and if you even look at the standards around discharges in places like the Great Lakes, there's a disconnect between everybody else using E. coli and most wastewater plants still using fecal coliforms. So you know that the uh, methods have changed over time. In 1914 and 1909, we were using the coliforms. That was the latest and greatest at the time. Um, by the 40s, fecal coliforms came around and started being used. And by 1986, uh, E. coli was being used. And of course, now if we come into the 21st century, we can go all the way to looking for the specific pathogens. We can look for the molecular signature. And I will talk about a little bit about that evolution. Now let me turn to this uh, bacteriological study. 
Um, between 1912 and 1914, this was uh, one of the largest studies implemented. It was a study of, of uh, transboundary pollution. The International Joint Commission is the commission that's appointed both on the Canada side and the government side, uh, the U.S. side by uh, on the U.S. side by the president. So we have a series of commissioners that have looked at the, uh, water quality, and IJC is still in effect. It was followed by another study of current proposed to look at sewage work. Um, uh, it uh, really led to the draft treaty on pollution in 1920, and there's nice uh, uh, history of by uh, Durfee and Bagley, published in 1997, which is how I found out about this. These are the study locations. It's interesting, you, you see Lake Michigan uh, there on the left-hand side of, of Michigan, that thumb, uh, didn't have any locations because it wasn't considered a transboundary waterway. So Lake Michigan is actually just left out of the assessment um, altogether, despite the fact that Chicago was a major city having issues, you know, uh, in terms of their water quality. So they focused on areas where they thought the uh, cross-boundary pollution was suspected, and you can see uh, these marked off. And what, what amazes me is that they actually took 17,000 samples. They had uh, almost 1,500 sampling locations. Um, it's huge uh, in its scope. They set up 17 labs, 17 labs. Uh, they set them up and they did the training. And of course, uh, the latest and greatest was the total coliform, and so that's what they were using. Look at these numbers that they were uh, using to suggest that the water was good or bad. Two total coliforms per 100 mils. That was considered good water for the, the Great Lakes when they were monitoring here. And 50 was considered polluted. And that's what the, that was their yardstick at the time. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it was, it was incredible when you look at the, the data. Um, the other thing was they used GIS, hand-drawn GIS, by the way. They have hand-drawn maps of the pollution sites, not, you know, not surprising. It was where some of the, the communities were, were um, you know, uh, increasing in population. Um, and, of course, uh, they have a series of recommendations. And it's amazing when you look at the recommendations that came along with the restoration. Uh, the, uh, some of these recommendations haven't changed in, a, in, in almost 100 years. So uh, prohibit discharge of untreated sewage ship ballast water into boundary water. So we just passed a law um, on ballast waters. Just recently was a ruling on <laughs> ballast waters. Uh, the discharge limit for Bacillus coli, which is, is the total coal form, uh, the discharge limit was 500. Now, I don't think that's changed very much. It's maybe about 200, uh, 200 fecal, so that's probably about 500 total coal forms. Garbage, sawmill, industrial waste, I think that that one probably got started to get uh, handled. Um, and um, interesting, if you look at the uh, first 50 years after this study, it took that long before some of these, any, even some of these were implemented. Now, in the meanwhile, 1920s to 1929, and Abel Woolman and, uh, was one of the key authors, he used to publish some of the, uh, you know, waterborne outbreaks. They used, at that time, they actually named the cities where the outbreaks took place. Uh, when I, I actually got this book, um, I, I found it uh, online, and I think I, I paid a couple hundred dollars for it. And so my husband was surprised when he got the bill and got the book because it was pretty beat up. <laughs> Um, but they publish the cities. Uh, we don't do that anymore. When we publish our national data sets, we don't, we don't really know where they're occurring. Uh, we know what state they're occurring in, but we don't know where they're occurring. An interesting, of the 14 um, top outbreaks of the, of the, all the 25, they occurred in the Great Lakes. And you can see they were occurring in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. Now this is typhoid. We really didn't have much cholera. So cholera, Vibrio, never made its way um, in any big way over to the United States and into the Great Lakes, perhaps because of the fresh water system. Um, and we also had dysentery. Now, they're not sure what was causing the dysentery. It might have been Shigella, which comes from sewage. If you know uh, the typhoid, the Salmonella typhi, was probably coming from human sewage and not from animal waste. Um, 
But dysentery was sort of generic, um, but in many cases it might have been the Shigella organism, which also is more restricted to sewage. And you can see this one outbreak in Detroit. Um, there was, um, you know, uh, 40,000 people sick of dysentery uh, during this outbreak. Um, and so these, this was just, this was just huge, um, a huge impact. So what have we been doing? A group of us have gotten back together to look at what has really been going on in terms of water quality degradation in the Great Lakes from where we started to where we are currently in needing this restoration. Um, this is a, a group that in, involves social scientists, hydrologists, climatologists, microbiologists. One of the things we found is that we, have to, we had to look at how we were going to overlay the spatial and the temporal uh, data sets because they were at all various different scales. And to make sense of what was going on from a socialist perspective, from an economic perspective, from an environment, biodiversity, climate, we had to try to get a handle on both time and space. And so that's what we focused in on. So we decided to use Lake Sinclair. Our goal is to use a historical perspective to as assess and predict how water systems have adapted um, to the environmental and social economic changes to really look at water quality. We wanted to link people, disciplines, and models. Uh, we took uh, wastewater infrastructure as one of our key uh, um, uh, areas of interest and um, uh, the uh, water quality along the shoreline. So that E. coli, that total coliform E. coli signature. So what about Lake Sinclair? Lake Sinclair is often uh, I've talked about the lost Great Lake uh, because people don't um, uh, don't think about it as much as part of the Great Lakes system. It's in between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. On the Michigan side, it's largely urbanized. That's where it is right now. It's about 72% a decrease in wetlands. That's one of our, our key predictors, 19, 1873 to 1973. And on the Canada side, though, it's got a lot more um, uh, protected wetlands, reservations, uh, natural Indian reservations, which have protected the uh, natural environment a little bit more agriculture and um, and so it's much more um, uh, ag and, and wetlands over there. 98% um, of the water that comes into Lake St. Clair comes from Lake Huron. Um, and 30%, uh, they, they suggest 30% of that is coming over from Lake Superior. And of course it drains into the Detroit River um, and um, there's been a big increase, a big focus on, of course, nutrients in the Detroit River, and particularly um, in the 70s to 80s decades. Now, this is what it looks like uh, in, a, in a white map. You can see the, the counties. There's, uh, there's a lot of counties in Michigan, and instead of taking a watershed perspective, um, much of the policies and much of the infrastructure was built by the political boundaries. Um, and this uh, makes it somewhat difficult. They, um, Detroit um, takes some of the capacity of this, these communities into, the, into their wastewater facility and they discharge to the Detroit River. But then all these little communities, uh, Mount St. Clemens and Oakland, Macomb County, this, the communities in there, uh, they're all discharging to the St. Clair River um, and includes a numerous wastewater treatment plants and combined sewer overflows. So these were the required data. You can see that on the climate data, we were gathering temperature, precipitation, lake levels, and ice cover. Um, on the water ec ecological side, hydrology, soils, land use, nutrients, um, the bacterial indicators, ecological indicators, Seki disk, you can actually get that instead of turbidity uh, way back if you try to get to the 1900s. Um, algal blooms, fish kills, and pollutant loads. The algal blooms and fish kills we're gathering actually from newspaper. So we're actually uh, gathering old stories from the newspapers. And believe it or not, the cars were about $200 uh, back there in the <laughs> 1920s. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. So we've got a lot of data to, to gather. We're tr starting to focus in on how we're going to put this together. Of course, the socioeconomic data, demographics, economic structure, infrastructure, water use, Water wells, about 50% of the population does use groundwater um, for their water supply. Of course, the policy and regulation 
um, and financing um, any of the social movements. Um, and of course, the health data was disease, infant mortality, and outbreaks. So it's quite a bit. So let me just show you a little bit. Um, this, uh, oh, I think I have a pointer here. Yeah, so this is Detroit area, and you can see the uh, increase in population. Of course, you know that Detroit's had a depopulation uh, recently um, because of the economics. But interestingly enough, the rest of the counties really have um, increased and stabilized. And here's uh, the uh, St. Clair County, um, a small population, but it's still increasing. And, and so the rest of the counties have actually stabilized in their population. And it's not just population. We've started looking at household and wastewater. And actually, household numbers have increased uh, twice as much as the population. So that, uh, that means it's not just population. It means we have more houses, more sewer connection, more water going into the system. Um, this is what the typhoid looked like um, in Michigan. Most of what you find if you're stra starting to look for health data is you mostly find it in the cities and they've tried to extrapolate it to the state. Uh, so it's, it's limited, but you can see that it was very high and up to 30,000. Uh, came down, of course, to, uh, to non-detect by about 1950s, uh, right around 1950s was the last time that you saw uh, any waterborne typhoid the in the 1940s. Um, however, this, um, when you look at trying to sort out the, the climate signal, especially for this big outbreak uh, in 1926, uh, uh, and here's the, the, the rain, and what you see is a, a gradual increase in rain, and the climate, both the historical climate data as well as what the prediction is, is that, that we're going to be wetter, not as the west here is going to be drier for the future. This area is going to be slightly wetter, but it's going to be coming in uh, greater intensity storms. So we're gonna, that means we're going to have more days of drought, more, uh, weeks, weeks of no rainfall, and then the rainfall and, uh, is going to come uh, in the same amount but in smaller time frames, so higher intensity. You can see a little bit of that uh, in these large bumps, and, and we don't know whether right now we're looking at some models that might look at what happens when you have a drought followed by high rainfall? Um, is that associated with any water quality degradation? So it's not as simple as trying to relate it just to, to rainfall. Now this is the water quality. Interesting, um, Montcombe County has been gathering data uh, since the 40s. It was all in notebooks, so we hired a bunch of undergraduates um, and looked over their shoulders every once in a while and had them put it all into an electronic version. They looked at um, 40 different waterways and about uh, 20 different beaches. So they actually have some of the waterways coming in, including the, the river. Um, and they started out with coliform data. They moved to fecal coliform data, and then they ended up with E. coli data. So we've gone to the USGS and several other studies where the USGS did a very large study over a decade where they looked at both total coliforms and fecal coliforms. So we use that for uh, normalizing the data. And then in, uh, when they s transitioned to E. coli, they did both fecal coliforms and E. coli. And so we use that database to try to transition. And what we found, even though the standards were changing along the beach from totals to E. coli, is that the water quality was actually deteriorating. And nobody had really ever uh, really looked and said, is our water quality deteriorating or not? We're having more beach closures but the policies have changed, we've got new standards, da 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 yada yada yada, we've been monitoring more, but it, it, do we have evidence that the water quality is degrading? And actually, they, we do. We have evidence now that the, uh, starting in uh, the, uh, around 1980, the water quality increased, and then we saw a dramatic uh, decrease in water quality. Now, this is, it's not quite as dramatic at every beach, but the trend, if you put all the data together in the Lake Sinclair area, is similar. So what is going on? Um, we're not really sure yet. We're looking at the, um, at the uh, uh, trying to um, put in some other things into the model, because it's not simply a matter of, of rain. Um, but they dredged a, ca uh, a canal that, that brought in stormwater uh, in the late 60s. Um, uh, the population started going up, uh, reached 4 million in this area, discharging 
uh, by that time frame. The other thing that happened was invasive species. I don't know if you know about the uh, mussels and the invasive species. This has dramatically changed the way phosphorus is entering the system and being used. And during the summer, there's many more algal blooms. Um, we don't know whether that has something to do with it. Uh, there, there's n now uh, probably five years of data that shows the al these algae blooms are also blooming E. coli, accumulating clostridia, accumulating fodge. So the nutrients are coming from the same sources as the bacteria and these algae in some way are perpetuating this. So we're not sure if it's a, if it's a combination of that um, or maybe a new CSO that was built um, but uh, this is, now we're looking into it. So it's, a, it's quite a complicated story in terms of this degradation. So the Water Quality Agreement was signed in 1972, and uh, since then, you probably know, the Great Lakes is the home of the largest waterborne outbreak ever documented in the United States, uh, in Milwaukee, Cryptosporidium. It's the home of the infamous um, Walkerton outbreak caused by uh, animal manure. Uh, in which both Campylobacter and E. coli 157 uh, caused a, a devastating outbreak to this small community. Um, it's the home of the South Bass Island outbreak, in which both septic tanks, sewage discharges, um, rain event, and uh, wind events, because wind moves the groundwater and the surface water around, caused uh, a, a very uh, massive groundwater contamination and a massive outbreak. Um, uh, multiple etiological agents. Um, it's the home of uh, increasing beach closures, over 500 beaches uh, alone, uh, important in the summer in this area. Uh, each day is estimated to cost the community $250,000. Um, home of outbreaks associated with recreational waters. Um, and this is one of the most recent ones of norovirus, uh, these uh, little parks. Uh, in fact, when they closed uh, this and they reopened it, uh, people started getting sick again. Um, and so they couldn't clean out the viruses out of the system, out of the sand, and out of the recirculation system. Michigan has a lot of wastewater plants. They don't discharge to the lake anymore. They're secondary. Some of them do seasonal disinfection. Sort of looks like the measles map. Um, but um, I, and this doesn't an, uh, include all the combined sewer overflows. Uh, that we have. In fact, East Lansing alone has four pipes they've got to fix that are combined sewer overflows in which untreated sewage and stormwater goes into our waterways. Now all these waters go to the shoreline. We also have septic tanks. We have the most septic tanks. Michigan has the most septic tanks along uh, the Great Lakes shoreline and it's estimated, we really don't know because it's county by county, about 1.7 million septic tanks in Michigan. Here's what we have to do when we study septic tanks in Michigan. I used to study septic tanks in Florida. It was a little bit easier. Um, these are our waterways that we monitor. Um, some of these are TMDLs uh, for monitoring, but you can see there's a tremendous amount of monitoring. And uh, over here, the yellow and the red are where we have both um, acute and chronic problems along our shoreline. Um, not surprisingly, it's where we have our populations, um, and so um, you can see that we still have red and yellow acute and chronic problems uh, with this increasing problem. Now, I think we're going to be using uh, in the future these molecular source tracking methods uh, to reevaluate what's going on. Um, they, uh, we can now uh, use a quantitative system and we can target almost anything that we want. Uh, you know that uh, the microbiologist and, and the medical professional ha profession has been doing the human microbiome study. And one of the uh, areas they've been studying, of course, is the intestinal tract, uh, trying to understand what's there. And of course, they found this bacteroides uh, group um, to be very prominent in the guts of humans and animals. Um, it's a uh, uh, a gram negative like E. coli, but it's there in very high numbers. You can see, see 10 to the 11th in one gram of feces. It's anaerobic, so, um, and it's not aerotolerant, so it dies upon exposure to air. They don't believe it's regrowing in the environment like E. coli or enterococci. 
Um, and it, so it doesn't survive long, but it's difficult to cultivate, so they've certainly gone to molecular tools. We've looked at a very specific Bacteroides, looked at 11 different animals, 230 fecal samples, uh, got a high specificity, and we've been able to relate it to E. coli and enterococci in wastewater. Of course, when you get to disinfection, this is a molecular tool, so we do not see a reduction in, uh, you know, um, after disinfection in the molecular signal. But we certainly have a good feeling for what comes into a wastewater plant in untreated sewage and what goes out with a good activated sludge system or if you have filtration. Um, you, some of you may know that California has run a very large project looking at the source tracking markers. Um, how are we doing on time? Doing okay. Okay, good. So um, uh, this is uh, associated with Assembly Bill 538. Uh, it wants method comparison, field case studies, and development of a guidance manual to use some of these source tracking markers. It was a very nice study. Um, Steve Weisberg, Ali Bohem, and Orrin Shanks from EPA helped run this. They had 12 animal sources, uh, multiple locales. They took sewage, um, septage, and um, of course, uh, fecal samples. So this was a blind study. About uh, 30 different laboratories, including ours, participated. Um, and there were over 40 different kinds of tests um, on these samples. So it's, it's, it's really one of the largest blind studies on these new methods. So we're really going to have a better idea now. These, um, uh, hopefully these reports are going to be coming out. These were presented at the American Society for Microbiology last year. These are now in, in, in paper form. They'll, they'll hopefully be coming out next year. They've been submitted. And uh, they now got a good idea of sensitivity and specificity. How are we going to use these different tools? The tool we've been using um, came out to be 92 and 96. But I should say that um, all these, just like chemical methods, actually, these DNA methods are like chemical methods. And you have um, a, a detection limit. And um, depending on how you, you um, decide whether you're going to call it a positive or, or negative at that detection limit, and your quality control is important. And so these are some of the things that are going to be coming out. I think what it means for the water industry and for people looking at watersheds is that we're going to have a set of tools now that you're going to have a lot more confidence in, in terms of how you interpret the results. And I think it'll be uh, really fabulous. So we started looking at this uh, statewide. We wanted to say, could we use this at the large scale? Could we, we, we used it in Lake Sinclair. We were able to start finding uh, a, re a relationship between the theta and Lake Sinclair. And the, but we wanted to say, could we use it for the Great Lakes study? So we took the uh, Lower Peninsula of Michigan, 64 rivers. It was a big study, so there were a lot of different parameters. Um, looked at land use, but more importantly, land characteristics. So population dynamics, agricultural buffers, cattle density, specific crops, um, and other types of activities. Um, and here's what the B theta looks like. Um, and the correlations we got, um, we did this at three times of the year. We did it in base flow spring thaw and rain event in the summer. So I'm just going to briefly show you what we've got during base flow right now because it's a, uh, it was a surprise to us. I think it's a surprise to the state. State of Michigan does not have a, a sanitary code, state sanitary code. So uh, they're looking at what they can do. The correlation was highest with septic tanks um, for our B theta. Total septic tanks in the watershed. Um, at low flow. And we know that low flow in Michigan, uh, it's groundwater. Groundwater is supplying 70% uh, of the volume, as well as um, the, the rest of it is coming in from effluents, actually, being discharged from those wastewater systems. And so um, this was a, uh, a big surprise to us that these non-point sources were actually the contributor of the B theta marker across the state at the, at the high scale. Now we're looking at whether we can use these metagenomics that have been used in, in the human microbiome in water. There's a number of groups doing this, both in Canada and the United States. What we're finding, if we, we start to look for just the virome, because we think it might be more host specific, is that about 72% of the gene sequences we cannot um, match to anything. So there's stuff out there. We don't know what it is. Um, of the 28%, we see that we can find these human viruses, but we also find animal viruses. We don't know if these are zoonotic. Of course, the plant viruses, unclassified. But the interesting thing is the bacteriophages. 
And we've thought we could use bacteriophages more effectively in monitoring uh, what's going on in watersheds than we ever have. And I think this is going to lead us to some very interesting targets um, in the future. So can we build a better database um, with molecular tools? Um, I think the next generation of genomic technology will advance our knowledge. Can we figure out every, everywhere there's water, everywhere there's uh, water, there's going to be microbes. So we've got a water microbiome no matter where we are. And what does it look like uh, in different watersheds? Um, will these molecular tools support new indicators and ultimately transform the way we, we test? Um, enhance our understanding of the role of land use characteristics and ultimately guide management strategies? And I think assist in the understanding of diffuse pollution under different climate at various scales. So I'll just end with saying that the Great Lakes group um, is a huge intellectual capacity in the Great Lakes, both on the Canada and the U.S. side. We're interested in sources, transport, and risk, development and applying new technology for identifying water quality uh, problems uh, in a science-based framework. We want to look at both the safety of drinking waters as well as recreational waters. And of course, they're looking at predictive science, and I think Jerry is actually going to uh, address that in his presentation. Our overall objective is to do a 100 year later study. We're looking at, should we do the same sites? Of course, keep, we've got to put Lake Michigan in there. Um, what tools are we going to use? Microbial source tracking, genomics, pathogens, and then use risk assessment um, with all the knowledge that we already have. Um, and um, uh, ultimately, uh, we're going to come back to uh, this, what's a good number? And I can guarantee you we're, we're way above that 50 total coliform per 100 mil that we started with 100 years ago. Um, so I just want to thank uh, all the students in my lab that uh, um, assisted uh, in various studies and uh, Dr. Dreeland, Dr. Zaragarki, and Dr. Fanny Kumar in particular, and funding from EPA, NSF, and NOAA, GLRI. Thank you very much. <laughs>